introduce to you Coluna, which is an open source branch cut and price framework. So in my talk, first I will briefly tell what is Coluna.gl. Then uh, since it's used to solve decomposition, decompose problems, I'll tell a bit about the decomposition approaches and then how to use Coluna to decompose and solve your model. Uh, so this is how Coluna is placed uh, in the jump uh, environment. So the user is able to use it through jump and matop interface. And for that, he also needs uh, block decomposition.gl, which is a package that is also developed by us. And what it does, it implements a few macros and, and functions that extends uh, some jump functionalities in order to allow the user to define his decomposition uh, using the variables and constraint indices of his jump model. And Colin is there to take all this information to solve the substructures defined by the user using block decomposition. So Colin is fully open source, uh, developed, uh, written fully in Julia. Uh, using we are using the latest versions of the packages. And the uses for for the for it would be to to solve dancing dancing wolf and banners uh, <laughs> decomposition. Uh, there's also in the future applications for robust and stochastic optimization. And so the first release was in January this year, but what I'm presenting you is not corresponding to this release because we are uh, redesigning uh, block decomposition and, and Julia, we are, we are updating everything. And also we have uh, the support of uh, MOSS. So a bit about uh, decomposition approaches. Uh, here I'm, well, I'll talk mainly about uh, density growth and vendors. And you can see this as one being the dual of the other in the sense that uh, in the density wolf, you decompose on the rows, so we have many, many resources. We have multiple resources, and these are linked uh, by these uh, blue rows, where are the, the linking constraints. And uh, whereas in the vendors decomposition, you have multiple decision levels, and these are all linked by these blue rows. So once you figure, fix your blue rows, you all your subproblems they can be solved uh, uh, independently. The same for density work. So an example for, for a problem that can be decomposed using density work is the cutting stock problem. So in this problem, uh, you have some stock material, one dimensional stock, stock material with fixed width. And uh, one must define cutting patterns in this stock material in order, in order to uh, cover demands of items. So you have to cut these big pieces into small pieces in order to, to satisfy these demands. So here are linking constraints that basically says that among all the cutting patterns that you define, you must cover the demand. And these are your, your, your sub-problem constraints that basically just say that for every cutting pattern that you define, it must satisfy the, the knapsack constraints or the, the width of your of stock material. So now, how do you reformulate a problem? In, a, in, a, in the simplest case, imagine you have your F problem where it's composed by these two parts, the blue part and the, 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 the green part here. And the blue part is making your life hard and the green one is what we call the, the sub-problem. And imagine this is relatively easy to solve compared to the, the, the original problem, the F problem. By relatively easy, I mean that in theory you can, uh, you can enumerate all your integer feasible points to, to the green problem. And let's say you can do that and call this this integer the, this set of points x. So with this set of points, you can define the convex rule of x. So the, the best possible formulation for x, you can define by saying that uh, it is a, com a linear combination of the, the integer feasible points. And now you have your lambda variable for each of these points. And this just tells how much you use of each of those points. Now, if you think lambda as your variable for your, your original problem, you can do this reformulation. Now your F problem is uh, described uh, only with uh, lambda variables. And now your blue constraints, now they just use, they just use the lambda, lambda variables to satisfy the demand. And your sub-problem constraints basically just say that you have to use one solution for the problem. Uh, now coming back to the cutting stock example, the reformulation for this problem would be something like this. So we minimize the, the number of cutting patterns that you use subject to covering the demand. Now you may ask, uh, so if you're enumerating all your feasible integer feasible points to, uh, to, uh, to a integer program, this may lead to many points. 
and this is true, but we actually don't generate don't don't generate these points a priori. So this is uh, now I'm going to talk about how to solve the the problem once it's decomposed, uh, and we actually don't don't just generate the points that are interesting for us. So if you take a branching bound, and the the, dif the difference here for a normal branching bound is that when you're going to solve a node instead of just solving an LP, you uh, iterate on solving the LP of the master problem and generating these new columns, these new variables, the lambda variables that are actually interesting uh, for you. So you generate only those that will decrease the objective function of the, the LP of your master. So imagine we are minimizing. And you use that typically with an oracle that produces the solutions for your sub problems. So I don't know if you can see, can, can you see this? Okay, so this is a log of Coluna. So basically here we are solving a node and you see here that, th so this is for an instance of the generalized assignment problem. So with 100 items, so it's not, it's not that small, it's already uh, quite big. And you see that the time to solve the master and sub problems, they're very small. So this is kind of the divide, divide and conquer effect. So you divide, you solve many times small structures but these are typically much faster than solving the big problem at once. And uh, so here you see the, the MLP bound and the dual bound. So these are the bounds, the primal dual bounds for the LP on your node. So these bounds, they will converge uh, by the end of the, of, the, of the solution process of a node. Uh, so why would you use decomposition approaches? Uh, first, you can exploit the, the structure of a problem, uh, as, uh, as I showed. Uh, and these, these reformulations can be done through, through generic schemes like Benders and density growth. Uh, the size, which a priori seems like a problem, it's actually not uh, the, 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 the hardest problem because you just generate dynamically these entities uh, as you need them. And uh, so these kind of algorithms are not so, so simple to implement. So a PhD student are doing his research, they will spend a whole PhD implementing a bridge and price. So we are here, we're here to provide a generic implementation for for, for this kind of, of, of special branch model. Now, uh, a bit on, on Coluna, how you use that and to decompose and solve your model. Uh, first, I'll tell you the general idea of the, let's say the interface for the user, and then I'll give you a few examples. Uh, so the general idea is basically you want to reproduce this kind of, of structure, right? So this is your the stru typical structure of your, of your problem, and you want to tell the solver, in this case, Coluna, okay, this is my price problem, and you have these three sub-problems, that uh, each of these sub-problems have these and these variables and constraints, okay? So we do that uh, by, so the, the user defines his jump model for his problem as, as if you would uh, feed it to Ciplex, but with uh, some few extra informations that are given through block decomposition. So uh, it basically tells using the variables and constraint indices, which is going to be his decomposition. And you use that, and he does that through the axis macro, which is defined in block decomposition. And then once we, he defined his decomposition, he calls the density wolf decomposition macro, and this will take all this information and put it in the right places. Uh, so a few examples. First, the generalized assignment problem. This is a problem where you have a set of items and a set of machines, and you want to minimize the cost of assignment of items to machines. So the cost here depends on items and machines, and also the, the, the weight of each item depends on the machine that it is assigned to. So we have your master, master constraints here, the blue ones, that says that you have to cover all items, and you have your sub-problem constraints that for each machine you have one sub problem, so we have, in this case, three machines, three sub problems. You have to respect the, the, the capacity of the machines. Uh, so this is what, what basically happens. This is your structure, so you have your three machines here, your master constraints linking everything. And uh, what block decomposition does is that when you define your decomposition, it will generate this tree, which just links everything, all the entities together. So you have your original model, you have your decomposition, uh, let's say deck, and you have your master and sub problems, one for each machine, linked together. And this this is the information that Coluna uses to 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 know which structures to solve at 
each time. So the code that generates this, I hope you can see, uh, actually from here, from the model definition to the, the objective function definition, this basically doesn't change for a standard uh, jump model that you, you would feed it to, to, to CPLEX or Ruby or that. The only thing that changes is that you, you define this axis here, machines. So here I'm defining machine axis that has three indices. So it means I have my decomposition will be done in machines and I have three machines. Now all my constraints and all my variables, they will be indexed in machines. And this is how we know where to put each variable and each constraint. So if you see here, uh, we have X, J, M for M in machines. And then once we have all this, we just call the decomposition, we give it a name, we say which axis I'm doing the decomposition on, and, and that's it. Now the next example is uh, the cutting stock example. And for the cutting stock, you may have, a, uh, as, uh, as I said before, you must define cutting patterns, and you don't know how many cutting patterns you will need to cover everything. It's not like in the gap. Uh, in the gap, you know how many machines you have. Here, you don't know how many cutting patterns you will actually need. So you may just say, okay, I need uh, at most 100. I will not, I never use more than 100, so I define 100 sub-problems. And you can do that, and Colin will solve 100 times the same sub-problem, because actually, if we see at the, at the, the, the cutting stock problem, all the sub-problems are the same, because they have all the same width, and the, the, the weight of each item does not depend on the machine, in this case, on the, the, on the, the pattern that you're defining. Or you can say that, okay, I may use at most 100 solutions, 100 patterns, but they are actually the same. So you give this information to Coluna, and Coluna actually will define only once a problem and use at most 100 uh, columns of that. And this is the, the, the decomposition tree that we define. We have here only once a problem, and you have an up, lower and upper bound of how many <laughs> columns you can use of 100. Uh, the code that generates this is uh, very simple again. Uh, the only difference from the previous one, besides the model, of course, is that you pass the, the identical uh, parameters, so colon knows that is identical and will solve only once instead of solving 100 times. Now you may wonder uh, how would you get the solution if what you define in your model is not exactly what Coluna is solving inside. So we provide this act active indices uh, function that will go through your axis. In this case, the axis is patterns because I'm defining cutting patterns and will uh, iterate only on the indices that you actually used uh, after the solution process. And then you can have your, 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 your solution. So for the CVRP, problem. Uh, now we have, uh, so the, the CVRP problem, basically you have a set of uh, trucks, a set of clients, each truck has a capacity, each client has a demand, and you have to cover, again, all clients. And this, this says that you have to cover all clients, and subject to your route is feasible, whatever it means for your specific case. And I'm just, I'm not even bothering putting the constraints here, because in the CVRP, Typically, you will not solve your, your sub-problem using a MIP. You will solve something use, using a, some sort of a resource constraint and shortest pass and some dynamic program. Uh, so the, the reformulation looks like this. It's very similar to the other ones. And I'm telling you this because uh, when you solve your, when you define your problem for a case where, where you're not solving your sub-problem using a MIP, you have your own oracle that solves the, the, the sub-problem, you don't even bother uh, bother writing the constraints for your sub-problem. You just say, okay, I write my variables, I say I say what are my master variables because this we have to define, and then uh, I add this pricing callback. So I take over the, the solution of the pricing problem, and uh, typically you pass a function, and if you're solving uh, using a, a RCSP solver, you will typically build a network to, do, to, to, to pass the solver. So this, how would you build a network? If for each problem, you just take the information on that's a problem and the information on your graph, and then build the network. And for the pricing callback, basically, when it is uh, hand to you, the, 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 the control, you just solve your sub-problem and check what are those negative reduced cost variables, uh, negative reduced cost variables, and then you add it to, to the master. Okay, 
Now, the last example is uh, where you can go a bit further and do a decomposition inside a problem that is already decomposed. So the example for that is the 2D cutting stock problem. And this problem, what it, it's very similar to the 1D cutting stock problem, except that uh, you're allowed to do 2D cutting patterns to satisfy the demand. So now uh, your items have a width and a height, and you must define these trips. And for each trip, you define a, let's say, 1D cutting pattern. So the formulation looks like this. You must cover all the items subject to the, the constraints on your strip. This is the stock material, and you're cutting it, right? OK. So the first level reformulation, so this is the original problem, and this is the first reformulation. This looks some, something very familiar with the cutting stock 1D except that to generate these lambda variables, you have to generate a strip, not only a cutting pattern, not only a 1D cutting pattern. <laughs> and this is your sub-problem formulation. So this is basically to generate a strip. What is a strip? Is a bunch of 1D cutting patterns with the items. And uh, you can say, oh, this looks something like the 1D cutting stock problem, so I can decompose it again. So now you have your original formulation, and which is decomposed. And to solve your subproblem, you solve it through column generation again. So you do a nested decomposition, and this is the ref the pricing reformulation. So the kind of structure that we want to reproduce now is something like this. So we have your big problem here, your master your master constraints, and your subproblems for your original formulation. And each of these subproblems have its own master and its own subproblems. And the decomposition tree that we generate looks like this. We have uh, your regional problem and your three decomposed pricing problems here. Uh, now, the code, so we ignore this part because this is just the formulation for the your regional formulation. What inter what's interesting here is that now you define two axes. And one axis, the one, one of them depends on the other. So the first one, you define a sheet axis, which are your, your 2D things here that you're going to generate. And then you say how many of them you have. And then you say that for each one of them, you define uh, the, the cutting patterns, which are the second level decomposition. And then you index your variables and constraints in this axis. And you call the density goal of decomposition two times in the nested way. Uh, and this was this. This was it about my, my talk. Thank you for attention. Sorry. Uh, we are in the process of implementing that. So, any question about the implementation or kind of how the, the axis macro works? So, you, it creates some type of object and then use that later on when you're writing like summations and constraints and things like that. So, how, did, how does that work? So, briefly, how this work? Uh, we use the sparse and dense arrays of jump to store which, so it doesn't work with the sparse. So, that's something that I'll talk to, to, to you guys about later. But for the dense, basically in, in the jump dense arrays, you store the name of the indices and the values and then the variables. So you have a you have a big table and the name of the indices, the axis, sorry, the value of the indices and the variables. And we say that for these, uh, for each of these indices, let's say the machines, the I decompose in the, the I index, I say that this is uh, axis, an axis that we define the axis, uh, block decomposition axis, and we know that they should be split in the subproblems. I know that answer. It might, I, I think I'm just looking at it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much.